This is our crew patch. This was a, a breakfast that I'd long dreamt of attending, and here I got my chance, along with the rest of the crew. The red ship, you can tell who they are, um, had been up all night. And this is the, uh, you finally see in the final scenes of the blue ship suiting up and the red ship coming up here. Uh, we got into our suits uh, in uh, plenty of time and we were excited and getting ready to, uh, to go to the pad. Uh, next scene you'll see us walking out and uh, this is about 5 o'clock in the morning heading out for an 8 o'clock launch. Well, we were sitting there looking at, uh, looking at uh, fairly blue skies, although we, uh, we were able to see some clouds coming around. Uh, eventually, after a slight delay, we got to go to, to launch, uh, and then things started getting busy for us inside. Right about this point right here, we knew we were going somewhere. Uh, just pretty incredible the way the vehicle leaps off the pad, begins accelerating, and doesn't stop for almost eight and a half minutes. Go from zero to a little over 17,000 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes, and when you divide those two numbers out and realize you're accelerating about 2,000 miles per hour per minute, uh, it makes sense that you feel the, the strength of push that you do in the back of your seat. And superimposed on that is a little bit of an earthquake from the solid rocket motors. It's a pretty impressive ride. One of the things that was impressive to me from the standpoint of the other crew members was we had a running dialogue going. Brian was uh, kind of calling out Mach numbers and altitude, and I would try to throw in something every once in a while. But in checking with the folk down on the mid-deck, uh, everybody seemed to be quite aware of what was going on. And it, that was a comforting feeling, uh, you know, as a commander to know that everybody was alert and, and, and ready to get going. The boosters came off right here, and that was, uh, of course, accompanied by a nice flash of... Uh of fire from the booster separation motors across the windows. Uh, we got a little bit of glazing on the windows uh, at that point. Uh, eventually it ended up burning off during the entry, uh, however, so it was never a factor. Shortly after Miko, we had external tank separation and we were able to get some pictures of it and uh, that's a picture of our external tank uh, after it left us. The challenge of the blue shift was to quickly jump out of the suits and grab some clothes and the books that we needed to begin operating and by about two hours after liftoff be up on the flight deck with the doors open and ready to power up the laboratory and all of the experiments. Uh, this is a scene of payload bay door opening which is about an hour and a half into the flight. Uh, it was already pretty clear I think to all of us that Atlantis had a high probability of just being a superb platform for our work for nine days because this had gone far more gracefully than you ever see it in any of your training and really gives you a comfortable feel for starting a busy flight plan. Uh, we turned to right away and had the lab powered up in short order and you see the typical view that we looked at out the payload bay windows here with the black uh, balls on their platforms which are the charge collecting devices that CPAC used to provide a return path for electrical current. And this is where uh, the orbiter crew did most of the work up in the forward deck. Uh, we're getting right here. We're uh, finishing up our flight control system checkout before re-entry. And over 220 maneuvers to accomplish over nine days to make sure all the experiments were pointed in the right directions. The, the space lab operation, the operation of the payloads were done from the aft flight deck uh, and mostly in the dark. That's why we don't have a lot of uh, pictures of it because it was uh, uh, during the night time. Like here, this uh, uh, API came alive, like I was saying, it was getting out of the locks and uh, pointing then to, to an aurora or to the artis uh, try to find artificial aurora. So the, it was always uh, exciting to see these this experiments actively working. It is pointing up. Okay, this is the scene of the aurora. The Earth's up, as you see it on the screen there, and you can see the three little turrets of the, uh, the Appy camera. I want you to, as you zoom in here, look at to the middle left, and you'll see a meteorite go by, actually above us in the picture here, but it's below us as far as the Earth goes. Um, the aurora, of course, are generated by... Uh, it's coming up now. There you go, yeah, you saw it. The aurora generated by protons coming from the sun, spiraling down the field lines. Here's the uh, electron beam coming out just a little right of center and superimposed on that is the uh, uh, results from the Appy camera. You can see a little glow to the left of center uh, about every 15 seconds. We're going to cut back and forth. Here's another beam firing. 
and then you see the, the, the glow that you see in the middle okay. is the natural aurora and in the middle of that you can see the spot from the beam and that was really the, the first time that this has been done in space and that we have been able to watch it from, from the, from, with a camera. So that, that's, uh, that beam really did look like uh, one of the phasers that uh, is in Star Wars or Star Trek. It's really uh, an amazing phenomenon to see this come out of the orbiter for the first time. In addition to the uh, electronic detector that the Appy experiment involved, the investigator also had supplied us with a fairly complex set of uh, photographic cameras and optical equipment. And you see me here on one of those tests. Often the target was the same as what the detector was looking at, but we could use different filters or, or other optical elements to get complementary data. Again, this is... Uh, this one was photographed to show you what we were doing when the lights were up a little bit. Normally this was done by, by feel and by memory of the procedure uh, in the dark as the target went sliding by. Everybody has something that they call their favorite when you go fly, and mine is lightning because um, I always tell everybody that to me it's like an orchestra uh, playing and uh, playing and lightning plays off, off each strike. You know, you'll see one and it just ripples all across the face of the earth. Uh, it's a beautiful spectacle. You can actually see the earth limb in the upper left-hand corner there. And the big city or the bright spot you see that's steady there is the city of Buenos Aires. Uh, as we're coming up uh, on an ascending uh, orbit here, and we're actually going up along the, uh, out over the Atlantic Ocean off the east coast of South America. This is the sunrise, the, the, the picture that you have with the different colors, so that the, from red to, to blue, from time, it's uh, really, uh, you, you see nearly all the colors and the different layers. There are quite a number of layers. That some of these uh, uh, colors are uh, produced by the uh, dust that is in the atmosphere. So it's, uh, uh, since the eruption of the Pinatubo, we have quite some dust, and this uh, adds to, to, to the red glow that we see in space. This is the redshift uh, going to work uh, in the morning. Uh, as, uh, we put new meaning into tumbling out to go to work in the morning, tumbling out of bed. But that's the bunks that we used, and they work very well to give us a good night's sleep uh, while the other shift was up working. Of course, we have to have our actors on board, and uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> it was tiresome work sleeping all night in those bunks. Brian had mentioned earlier that we were going to show you some of the, the mundane types of things that go on. And uh, so for the next few seconds here, you'll get to see us uh, as we prepare food. We did a number of things that, that you would not necessarily think are done on a spaceship, but you've got to eat, and that means that somebody's got to go to the kitchen. Uh, that's our water dispenser and uh, an oven that every once in a while you'll see Kathy open the door here and stick food in. Uh, the foods were very, very tasty. Uh, very, very filling, although you wondered that because we seem to be eating all the time. Um, we really enjoyed the food and drink, and uh, so that's kind of one of the things that's going on here. In addition to this, something you won't see, we had to clean filters. Uh, you had to dust and, and mop, and we'll show you a little picture of us swabbing, as I call it, later on. Uh, here Dave's eating one of the favorites of almost all the crews, and that's shrimp cocktail. So uh, you get a chance to see some of the better food there. And it behaves much better than it does down here. Uh, gives you an opportunity to, to think about it. Here we were doing some of, uh, another one of the more fun things to do is decide how you would like to have your M&Ms. You just uh, turn them free and then you go get them. And kids always have a very good time with this. They can uh, imagine being there. And I'll do a uh, reverse slam dunk here in a second and gobble up one. One of the secondary experiments we had on board was the SAR-X, or the Shuttle Amateur Radio Experiment. Here you see Dave uh, talking to someone. I don't remember. Do you know, remember where you were, Dave, no, doing that? I think I was talking to a school. And you'll see the concentration, yeah. trying to listen to the, the kids' questions here in a minute and, and then be able to make answers. It was kind of fun to talk to auditoriums full of school kids while you're flying right over the top of them. Uh, three of our crew members, um, Dave, Kathy, and Brian, talked to all seven continents during our uh, nine days in space. Here. Well, here, here you see our commander keeping fit for the entry, and I'm really glad he did that, because he did an excellent job. Um, Charlie was doing a, a DSO uh, for 30 minutes every day running, <laughs> which he sometimes enjoyed, but maybe not. <laughs> of course, I had a different approach to uh, what you should do with a treadmill. Here you see them uh, changing Lyo out. Basically, the treadmill was mounted across those, uh, those, those holes in the, uh, in the floor of the mid-deck where we keep the uh, lithium hydroxide, uh, lithium hydroxide, extract the carbon dioxide that we exhale, 
during the day. Of course, we do that once every uh, shift. And then uh, when we do that, we do it rather carefully. We have to put it into these little cellophane packets to make sure that the, uh, the debris from the, from the canister, which can be toxic, uh, doesn't get into our atmosphere. And then you saw what I was doing with the treadmill. Um, I got a lesson in what physicists do with treadmills, and you will get an opportunity to see it come into view here. Uh, Dr. Fole was real big on moments of inertia and uh, getting an opportunity to try different things and see if he could display varying moments of inertia of different components that we had on board. You see, I've been told to hang on the ceiling and just be quiet and out of the way and hold the treadmill. The treadmill so <laughs> what else was I going to do with it? <laughs> was it Mike's version of exercise what? was far preferable. One of the things you have to worry about is with seven people, you generate a lot of trash. And we have a trash monster down here, and we had to be careful when we fed him every day that, <laughs> that we didn't get caught. It, you didn't want to had, let him get you, because then you get pulled down below the mid-deck, and that's a bad place to be in. One of the things I learned a long time ago when we started training was that uh, I had two rabid golfers on board. I say, I would say avid if I counted Byron in, but Byron is not quite rabid like, <laughs> like Dave and Brian. But this is the uh, 44th hole at, at the Atlantis uh, Golf Club, and I'll let them describe it to you. Well, teeing it up uh, is pretty easy. <laughs> Never falls off the tee. Never falls off the tee. Now watch this carefully because this is the longest drive in history. That's about 15 miles right there in about three seconds. That's how far that ball went. Now lining up putts is very difficult and Brian, he had a good idea here except he was lining it up from the wrong, from the wrong attitude. So we had, to, we had to correct that and, and figure out, of course, neither he and I could really get it lined up properly and it took uh, Byron to, to hit it in here in a minute. I he remembered that we were not flying <laughs> level but inverted here, so he took the opposite approach. That's right. These two guys gave me a good reading, and as uh, typical caddies, you know, one says break uh, down and right, the other says break up and left. So uh, <laughs> when I got up here, I just kind of tried to hit it towards the hole, and uh, voila. <laughs> <laughs> the 45th hole. We were fortunate in having uh, three Academy graduates on board, two from the United States Naval Academy and uh, one from the U.S. Air Force Academy, and we happened to have a United States Military Academy graduate as a Capcom for several of our shifts, so we sent this uh, visual message to, to Sam Gamar while he was down there, just, just in love. Charlie was, uh, Charlie was really good at documenting what other people were doing, but uh, we, we were a little lax in getting him, so we finally wanted to try to find him commanding. So this is, this is a view of what Charlie does when he's commanding. You Me see what the crew is doing. Yeah, now. meanwhile, down below. <laughs> Charlie said something about, uh, why don't you, you, Brian, you take your shift downstairs and swab the decks. And, and I didn't know what that meant, because I'm not in the Navy. So he had to explain it. But we found out on Blue Shift very quickly what that meant as we moistened up washcloths and went all over every surface we could find to, as Charlie said before, neaten the ship up and return it in proper form to the folks that had given us such a good spacecraft. Yeah, and even I was employed for that, and it's something they have never told them before that they have to do that on board. <laughs> I've never got any training for it either. <laughs> Well, finally, after nine days, it, it was time to come home. And I must say, I really wasn't ready to do so, and I don't think anyone else was. Um, we were very, very comfortable on orbit. We had a very successful mission. We had a good routine, and we were enjoying ourselves immensely. And uh, this is really the beginning of the end of our, our glorious flight. This is the, uh, the plasma going out the back end of the orbiter, and it was really pretty impressive as Kathy and I took some pictures back out the overhead. Uh, it, and then we took them back up forward, and you can see the, the reflections of that on both Brian and Charlie as we're going through entry. It is totally dark outside, by the way. The camcorder this can't really do this justice. In particular, the colors, which are all sorts of shades of salmon and pink and orange, uh, they really do look somewhat like the inside of a blast furnace. You may notice the horizontal streaks or small blips of light through the scene. Those are electronic noise that are created in the camcorder because of all the electrical energy that's involved in the process that you see outside lighting up the sky. Once the, uh, once the light show was over, we got in, uh, we flew in a daylight somewhere around Mach 6 or so, approaching the Cape, and uh, we turned onto the, onto the hack. We had some pretty good, uh, pretty good winds, which made it a, a healthy turn for us. Uh, and I got it around about halfway, and Charlie picked it up. And um, When I took over from Brian, we, we basically, on board, we have guidance that we follow that tells us whether things are good or bad. And um, I mentioned to the guys in the office this morning, by the time we got ready to roll out on final, Everything looked like it was good because we, we go to another um, 
landing aid that's called a microwave landing system, and it gets you, you know, real fine lineup. And the orbiter, again, was amazing because when we fly our simulators, you always see things jump around when you get the MLS as, as you're getting to the final fine guidance and everything. But uh, on the orbiter, it, it did not move at all. So we were right where we wanted to be. Um, basically, what I did was, was get everything set up during the what we call the outer glide slope portion of the approach and then make a final adjustment just before the touchdown about the 30 or 40 foot point and let the orbiter land itself. And it, it's an amazingly stable vehicle. Uh, it flies very, very well. It flies better than any, any simulator that, that I've ever had the opportunity to fly. So um, there was nothing surprising about its performance at all uh, unless you want to say that it performed a lot better than I, than I thought it was and it handled a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Um, that was it, kind of the, the end of the flight. 